I don't know a single content creator who actually enjoys making power rankings. It's more or less a thing that you have to do at the start of every season that you know will generate likes or generate clicks that everyone will talk about for reasons unknown because it's some of the most low effort content imaginable. And of course, if you get it wrong, you can always say, yes, but that's not the point. The point was that I made you talk about it. See, look at that, look at that. And everyone gets it wrong anyway, so there's absolutely no pressure. Yeah, I, I hate doing power rankings. I couldn't force myself to do them about LPL. I, I just, I really just couldn't. But for LCS, I asked myself, what do people actually like about power rankings? What's fun about them? What can I actually get into? And of course it's the spicy takes, right? It's the stuff that you think that other people don't think. Being able to argue those takes, talk about how you think that the teams will play out. So instead of doing a traditional power rankings, I just decided to make this video about power rankings takes. Three ideas that I have that I haven't seen repeated a lot a lot of these will be about the primarily rookie rosters because honestly I think people just see them, don't really recognize the names and put them at the bottom four. So having a better discussion about them is probably productive and then just give you an idea of some of the ceilings of these teams. The main thing I care about and probably everyone else too because the mid-season showdown is kind of nebulous, kind of whatever, is where these teams end in 2021. Also another thing to keep in mind is I think the most important roles in the game right now are mid jungle and support is particularly how the jungle will be able to use priority to invade, get a significant lead, and how the support will back them up and control the map and make really smart plays throughout the game. So generally speaking, if you're not really sure why I'm saying something or I don't explain it, that's probably the explanation. All right, so the first thing is that the uh, Golden Guardians won't finish last in 2021. Yeah, I know. I already feel like a crazy person for even suggesting it. Honestly, in all likelihood, they do finish last. Honestly, my main thing with Golden Guardians is that these players are going to take a ridiculous amount of ramp up time and they probably won't, still won't be very good by the end of the year. I honestly do think that there is a purpose for Academy and Academy does teach a lot of fundamentals that helps people prepare for the LCS. I think anyone who goes on rants about how this doesn't exist in Korea or China is full of shit because very obviously it does. They have extensive not only uh, academy systems but farm systems underneath the teams which we don't really have anything that comes through so throwing a player into the LCS after collegiate feels a little bit rough. All that said I actually have a lot of faith in the top lane and the bottom lane if you watch CLG games. Stixie was definitely not the worst AD in the LCS. He played a lot of fights mechanically well even if his positioning initially was sometimes pretty poor. My main issue with this roster, however, is that even if I think Niles and Sticks and Nube eventually get to somewhere they want to be, or maybe some of their academy stand-ins get to somewhere they want to be, I don't have a really high opinion of the ceilings of Iconic and Ablaze Olive. Of the four mid laners coming up from academy this year, and yes, I am including Insanity here, I actually think that Ablaze Olive has the lowest mechanical execution ceiling. However, I think he has a pretty decent sense for engages, and I really like that Golden Guardians are promoting him internally, so I hope he succeeds and proves me wrong. But that's generally where I see the biggest question mark for this team coming from. So the question is, what teams can I think of that actually can finish below them? And I came up with CLG and Immortals. Probably not both. Probably just one will finish above, below them. A lot of this is down to, I think, Golden Guardians will at least foster a pretty good environment with the existing stuff that they have, and that might be enough to push them over the edge. But really, when you look at these teams, I would say that both Broxa and Xerse have really similar issues in terms of just pathing and using the agency of their champions. I don't tend to fault either of them because I feel like Broxa was thrown into a Fnatic situation kind of as a band-aid and then forced to for most of his career. How can we win with you as an existing player rather than really letting you develop? And then of course, Xerse, I feel like was put behind mid laners for most of his careers that weren't really helping him. So he basically just found ways to defensively farm until six and try to force fights off of that. I think I remember a game where he played on Origin this year where he effectively full cleared, had one decent game attempt with a wave stay in good position, burned the flash, and then didn't really do a whole lot for the rest of the game. Obviously his laners were at fault for that to an extent, but a lot of just his lack of agency in general doesn't really bode well for him to be a leader of a rookie team. 
I also think the INT bot lane is one of the more overrated bot lanes. I think both Ayla and Isles are actually better than Destiny. Reyes is definitely the worst AD coming over from Oceania. And I actually think Golden Guardians' bot lane is already better because both Destiny and Newbie will have to learn a lot of game fundamentals and how to play around the map just by watching the games. And then of course we look at CLG, which I already texted on Broxa, and this is going to be one of the most wishy-washy things I say in this video, but it feels like none of the players on this team are there because they know how to win rather than because they just know how to not lose. <laughs> and of course, if all you do is know how to not lose, you're in a weird nebulous space where you can't really know how this team is going to do. In general, I felt like the players on this team were all together the worst aspects of their existing lineups, with the exception of obviously Belter and Smoothie who were already there, and then they just kind of just ended up here together. As in general, because these teams don't really give me a lot of confidence and I don't see a lot of theory behind how the roster was put together other than Insanity and Revenge being really interesting developmental pieces, I can easily see either of these teams finishing below Golden Guardians. Now, most of you have probably realized that I didn't include Dignitas, which is a team that most other people just have lumped together in the bottom four with Immortal, CLG, and Golden Guardian. And I also see a lot of people responding to this segment of the video with, well, she's biased. And you can really see why you can come to that conclusion. But this roster also has a lot of interesting upside from the core of Dardock and Aphromoo. And those players usually at least let teams start off pretty strong, if not taper off towards the end. I also think if you're coming into 2021 thinking of Bacot and Saligo as the players they were in LTS in 2019, you're really doing them a disservice. I think a lot of times when rookies debut super early on in their careers, they're written off just because there's not a lot of people watching Academy, there's not a lot of people who can actually judge how Academy players improve. And I'm not even here saying, oh, I'm such a good coach that I made these players better. No, I think a lot of the improvements that they made were really self-driven. For example, Fake God, I've seen a lot of people citing his statistics and saying, oh, his landing was X, Y, and Z, but the general, uh, you can probably blame that on me. He got very little jungle attention and was generally able to just manage the wave well and carry a lot of our games from survive side. In terms of Saligo, I think he falls mostly right now into the category of a player who plays teamfights really well and just generally in a front to back sense and he's working on a lot of other elements and getting his laning to a point where it's consistent on stage as well as in scripts. And I think a lot of people will be kind of excited about the academy mid laner behind him. I think Yasui has a lot to work on in terms of making his leads consistent because he gets a lot of lane wins off of cheese and doesn't really necessarily manage ways well but finds a lot of really cool angles in the game and as a result mid lane is a pretty exciting position for Dignitas. I was also really pleasantly surprised by Asta in terms of team fighting. I think if he returned to LCS in his academy farm he'd solo lose games just off of bot lane but uh, Afro obviously has almost had some of his best performances when his rookie is brand new to the game and I think that maybe that keeps him slightly more engaged and this kind of responsibility will really make him come out and come alive and look like a, a really strong support. You know, last man standing, hashtag. Obviously it's difficult to talk, talk about Dardock because traditionally teams have done well, had somewhat of a honeymoon phase and then started to go a bit downhill. Obviously everyone secretly roots for this guy to turn it around and to have a really, really focused split that keeps a strong performance, performance throughout. Still really exciting team to watch out for. I think they're quite a bit underrated in terms of roster construction and just how I think they'll perform. Probably if you watched my FlyQuest video, you're most interested in hearing where I think FlyQuest will actually end up. I think there will be a block for second and third place the last two world spots between TL, TSM, and FlyQuest, and that will be the eventual result of the 2021 League of Legends season in LCS. Since I already talked a lot about FlyQuest Upside in my previous video, I'm mostly going to talk about the other two teams I mentioned, which are Team Liquid and Team Solo Mid. As for Team Liquid, I think for the second year in a row, they've made a sort of strange choice as a jungler. I think that Torrent's pathing is generally pretty solid, but the way he plays team fights is really, really questionable. And got bailed out a lot on FlyQuest by Ignar initiating most of the fights. I think since Team Liquid have Core JJ, 
probably he'll function just fine and they'll still be a really really top team so i don't think it will be something that necessarily holds him back i do think however there will be more emphasis on the carry jungle meta and this being solidified so i do have a lot more question marks around this rather than before where he could just play like trundle set and be totally fine but i do see palafox and jose diodo potentially outpacing the likes of 100 thieves mid jungle in closer in the Monte, so that's part of the reason why i think this team is a little bit better or can maybe contest team liquid as for team swallow mid i actually think lost and sword art have a really good argument for best bot lane in the league that's a huge can of worms though so just suffice it to say that i'm pretty excited to watch them play a lot of this will kind of depend on how sword art pans out since there are already some pretty impressive bot lanes like fbi hookie tactical core jj and spent Vulcan. Loss also has a lot of SBI aggressive qualities and I could see him performing better than most of the ADs in the league already. I think he's an upgrade over double lift in terms of what he'll bring to the team. That said, I already expressed my questions about how who he has been playing a lot of his matchups towards the end of the summer and also in terms of how he's playing out his lane where if jungle has to be allocated to his side of the map then they're really just misusing their resources in terms of how bot lane can do for them. And that ultimately can be something that costs them. Ultimately, I did rate FlyQuest in fourth. This mostly comes down to the support role and support having so much agency. I think that the S tier supports in the LCS right now are Vulcan, Quart, JJ, and Sword Art. If Sword Art for some reason doesn't work out for TSM, then that's the team that FlyQuest overtake and go to Worlds for. I do think Diamond can develop into that role, but he's still working on learning a few things, some of which I outlined in my previous video on FlyQuest already. Obviously, Evil Geniuses have a very strong support too in Ignar, but I think that Evil Geniuses have a lot of other problems, and a lot of other content creators have talked about Evil Genius ranking them in fifth, so just kind of look up what they said. Ultimately, my end of season expected tier list looks a little bit something like this. Feel free to leave a comment if you have any quibbles below, like the video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Whatever you floats your boat, thank you and have a great day.